if you look at the past 150 years, most kind of challenges with money have been solved with more and more centralization. Uh, but of course, that comes at the cost of corruption uh, and and the, the downsides of centralization. Um, decentralization has a cost to it, but then it gets benefits. Uh, and in this era, in an era where we want to send money, you know, on the internet to buy something, on the uh, we want to send it around the world, uh, we want to send it just across all sorts of areas. Um, the abstraction needed compared to commodity money is so big, and so I think governments have had a lot more arbitrage opportunities. We can imagine, for example, what the platonic ideal of money would be. It'd be something like if if we could just mentally beam gold to each other, for example. And if that's just if that's just something we could always do. It'd be very hard for governments to come in there and be like, no, no, stop doing that. Here's these paper things you're going to trade around and you're going to use that as money. It'd be hard to introduce that. Instead, the way fiat currencies get introduced is basically by initially trying to solve a problem, which is gold's portability, you know, authentication uh, and other challenges. And then over time, people get rug pulled. And it, it just keeps happening because it's on one hand, they're trying to solve a, a problem, but then the incentives start coalescing. And then they they ruin it. And then if it gets bad enough, there's some degree of reset, some degree of decentralization again, but then they just they do it again. And one of the problems we see in developing countries is that it's hard for them to ever like separating institutions is very hard. Um, basically, power coalesces and then someone with all the power has to agree to like give some of it up. So to make things like an independent judiciary or an independent central bank, it's actually really hard to do. Did you know that the Egyptian money supply has been growing at an alarming average rate of 20% per year? This isn't just an isolated case. In the United States, the unchecked expansion of the money supply could be a ticking time bomb for economic collapse. Lynn Alden highlights how centralized control over money leads to dilution and devaluation, causing our savings and earnings to lose value rapidly. Imagine needing a 20% wage increase every year just to maintain your purchasing power. Alden explains that power corrupts and the centralization of our financial systems exacerbates this issue, making it harder for individuals to preserve their wealth. For example, in developing countries with limited banking access, people are trapped in a savings prison where their hard-earned money is continually devalued. Even in the US and Europe, while banking access is high, inflation often outpaces interest rates, eroding savings over time. Alden argues that decentralized solutions like Bitcoin and stable coins could offer a way out by providing more stable and less controlled forms of money. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a lot of countries, it just doesn't happen. And so you have very coalesced government and the, the government can just fire the head of the central bank whenever he wants. You know, the president can just get rid of him. Um, and so because of that, uh, you have a very centralized system, which is tends to decay more quickly than one that has more degrees of checks and balances in it. Yeah, if you even look at um, Federal Reserve settlement practices between banks, um, the evolution of that over time. So banks used to settle with armored transport of gold and, and paper banknotes. Uh, and then with the with Morse code, they eventually just said, no, no, like, okay, so all of you put some of your gold and in, 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 uh, with us as the central bank. And if you wanna transfer to another bank, just send us a Morse code signal and we will, you know, we'll, in our ledger, we will, you know, move, move your allocation to that other allocation by writing it down. And it's just like, it's a way more efficient way to transfer that. But of course that's reliant on abstraction, a layer of centralization uh, and other things like that. And so most of these things, it, it's, it's usually the way, reason it happened is with the argument. And in some cases, the real use, usefulness of, of efficiency. They say, well, this is what we're going to do now. It's going to give us more stability and more efficiency. And then enough time goes by and then they just rug pull. Um, and it's like they, they might not even been attending to rug pull in the beginning. It's just how things keep working out uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in history. You know, with 160 currencies in the world, how many would you want to hold? Uh, you know, maybe a handful of them are decent for an intermediate period of time. Most of them are terrible even in an intermediate period of time. Um, and people get trapped in these, they're kind of like fiat matrix. You know, like they're in they're in a world that it's hard to even know you're kind of in that prison. And basically what it is, it's an accounting prison and a savings prison, which is that, for example, you know, Egypt's money supply is growing by 24 percent a year. 
uh, on average. It, it's been something averaging like 20%. Now it's like 24%, uh, according to economist Steve Hankey. Um, and so imagine you're in an environment and the unit of account you're using is increasing in supply by 20 some percent every year. Um, so now everybody in the society has to find a way to get 20% wage increases every year, or they're getting their share of the ledger diluted. Um, they also have to figure out what they're going to do for their savings. So they're going to, are they going to go to the gray market and get dollars? Are they going to store it in gold and then pay all the friction? Just like, you know, there's, there's a, this is like a spread that you have to do uh, in that environment. So in the United States and, and um, in uh, you know most of Europe and other places, there's very high levels of banking access. But in there, in a lot of developing countries, including Egypt, the so the overhead cost of a banking account is like not worth it for someone who has a net worth of like three hundred dollars. And so there's a very cash oriented business, and they're literally holding uh, paper banknotes and getting devalued. Uh, and of course. By putting your money in the banking system, you're also getting highly surveilled. That's one of the costs of it. You're getting controlled. You're getting surveilled um, by doing that. So the exchange is okay. You'll get diluted slower now, um, but uh, you've you've given up a lot of your control, and you're it's only available to kind of the, you know, the middle class and higher uh, in those regions. Um, and in many cases, interest over the long run does not fully keep up with inflation. Um, and so, you know, if the money supply is growing every year by 20%, those interest rates have not been 20% the whole time. Right now, they're trying to get their grip on inflation uh, and trying to tame it. Uh, but there was a period of time where interest rates were like 11% and money supply was still growing by 20%. Um, and they were using things like their reserves to – like their central bank reserves, their FX reserves to, to basically keep the pound, the, the Egyptian pound harder than it otherwise would be. Uh, based on its supply growth by selling reserve assets and kind of maintaining a, a bit of a peg to the dollar. So you can disguise that for a period of time, and then it all kind of comes out at once with these big devaluations. So over over like a full, you know, like a 10-year, a 20-year period, there's a big chunk of the time where your interest rate is not keeping up with inflation. And then anyone that's in the cash market is not getting any interest rate at all. And so going back to the earlier question of of – you know why shouldn't the state issue money? Is that one is they're just not good at it. Power power corrupts, and having the ability to control everyone's like accounting and savings unit is uh, a rather extreme form of power. Um, and but I would say is that you know when you when when the entire world operates like this. So a lot of people say I, I wish we'd just go back to another system. But when you see something happening literally everywhere. You have to recognize that the incentives for the system being like that are very strong. Um, uh, that there's not there's not like one country outlier that doesn't do this. Um, and so, in because of that, um, I think only with other technologies is that even going to be a possibility, not even a certainty. Uh, and that's that's kind of a challenge going forward, which is that I think people deserve better money. I think that. You know, if money is a market good, it's something that that should have competition. Like people should be able to choose what money they use. And <clears throat> in the modern era, you know, if a nation if a nation state controls the borders, so they control both the physical borders, so ports of entry, you can only bring so much cash or gold through an airport, for example. Um, or then they control the financial borders in the sense that if if your bank wants to wire money internationally, uh, the government has full control over you know what what amounts or where or who can do that. So they have full control over both types of, of in and out um, transactions with obviously some small amount of, of contraband and things like that that can get through. But basically, they have a very tight lock on the borders. Um, and some of the recent technologies start breaking those currency silos. So Bitcoin, stable coins basically say either a decentralized currency or a centralized currency, but in another jurisdiction, like say a, a gold-backed stablecoin in Switzerland or a dollar-backed stablecoin in the United States or any other country, these are now these centralized hubs that can be sent peer to peer. Um, so, like you can you can send it with a QR code over a video call, you can send it uh, over email, you can send it over a, a, a DM, um, and so money can now kind of go around those border checks, and that actually allows money to compete. Uh, more globally, uh, the way that it used to. I think fairly quickly, as this technology catches on, 
it starts with the weakest uh, jurisdictions not being able to maintain a currency anymore because not only are they competing with things like Bitcoin, but they're also competing with every other currency more than they used to because of that border problem. So now with stable coins or um, you know whether it's gold backed or dollar backed stable coins or euro backed stable coins, most of them are dollars right now. They now have to compete with those, and they have a lot less control over their financial borders than they used to. So, kind of like how when a, a a currency starts to fail, people start to dollarize it. You know, the government doesn't really want that to happen, but uh, it just starts to happen. Uh, people, it gets bad enough that people start to just kind of do whatever they can to to use other monies. And what this technology does is it vastly reduces the frictions for them doing that. So I think at a, at a much lower threshold, um, currencies can get crowded out by foreign currencies that are stronger. Thanks for watching today's video. Let's recap the key points from Lynn Alden's insightful analysis. We discussed the alarming growth of money supplies in countries like Egypt, where it's averaging 20% per year, and how similar trends in the US could lead to economic instability. Centralized control over money leads to dilution and devaluation eroding our savings and making it difficult to maintain purchasing power. Alden emphasized the dangers of this centralized power and highlighted how decentralized solutions like Bitcoin and stablecoins could offer a more stable alternative. If you found this information valuable, please give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more in-depth financial analysis. We'd love to hear your thoughts, so leave your comments below.